Well, good evening, everyone. I'm Danny <clears throat> Mando, and welcome to another sports webinar. We've been doing these now for close to four years, and they're all fantastic. And most of the work and most of the credit goes to my co-chair, Dave Kravitz, from Worcester, Massachusetts. And uh, we're really excited. We're really excited tonight because our guest is the nephew of one of our everybody's favorite person in the organization, one of our newest members, <laughs> Jerry, Jerry Agris, who uh, if, if when you get to Jerry's age and you're as good as Jerry, you're all set. So uh, thank you very much, uh, Jerry, for making this happen tonight. Um, I'm going to uh, hand it over to David, and David's going to hand it over to Norwin, and Norwin's going to hand it over to Jack. Go ahead, David. There we go. All right. Well, we have a good one for you tonight. Hello, and welcome to the Sports Affinity Webinar presented by the Federation of Jewish Men's Clubs. FJMC is the parent organization of over 250 conservative men's clubs. Members around the world brings value and adds meaning <laughs> to the lives of men and their families. FJMC has presented more than 100 webinars. I'm Dave Kravitz with Danny Manjo. We are co-chairs of Sports Affinity. We will be hosting tonight. We'll mute everyone so we can enjoy the presenter's remarks so we can take questions. It is now my pleasure to introduce Nolan Murrins, a past regional president of the Midwest region, and he will introduce our speaker. Thank you, uh, Dave and Danny. Uh, this evening, it's my pleasure to present uh, Jeff Agrist, who is the deputy sports editor and media columnist for the Chicago Sun-Times. He'll be talking about the wide world of sports and associated media developments. Uh, Jeff joined the Chicago Sun-Times in June of 2002. He previously spent six years as senior editor of Pro Football Weekly. He received his bachelor's degree in journalism from the University of Illinois, Urbana-Champaign. Uh, Jeff is not only a friend, but also a fellow congregant at Temple Beth Israel, Reform Temple in Skokie, Illinois, and has been active in uh, the TBI Brotherhood for many years. And as Danny mentioned, he is the uh, great nephew of uh, Jerry Agrist, our highly revered international past president. Uh, so without further ado, I'd like to introduce, well, we've introduced uh, Jeff to present Jeff uh, for his opening remarks. Jeff. Thank you, Norwin, and thank you, everyone. This is um, a real pleasure to be asked to be here. Um, so it's quite an honor to join you all and meet you all and speak with you all and talk about sports and sports media, two of my favorite topics, probably my only topics that I'm fluent in. Um, as Norwin said, I've been at the Sun Times, the Sun Times since 2002. Uh, it's been quite a quite a journey there. We're on our third or uh, fourth building, although I haven't been to the fourth building yet because we moved there after COVID and I haven't gone back into the office because there's been no need to go back into the office. We're now at uh, Navy Pier. My first year was when it was in that um, storage boat shaped building along uh, Wabash and the river, uh, which is now where Trump Tower is, but that was a real thrill to be in that building. That building had a lot of history and mystique. And um, if, you've, if you've seen it, you can understand uh, the reverence that people who know it have for it because of all the famous people who worked through there um, I'll never forget, though, how the building had to go. One of my first experiences with the old place was um, whenever they would have fireworks shows on the river by uh, Navy Pier, uh, we'd turn to look. But one night it was raining and the rain was eventually coming into our building through the windows. So we knew that the place was about on its last legs. Um, from there, we moved to uh, uh, the Merchandise Mart, that area near the Apparel Center. Uh, on, off of New, off of Orleans. Then we moved further west out to the West Loop for a couple of years, and now we're at Navy Pier. And like I said, I've only seen pictures of it, which is fine because the the way we're working now, as a lot of papers are, we're all remote, which is incredible to imagine. But we have um, a setup by our IT staff, which has just just been so phenomenal. We don't have to brave the commute 
on the Kennedy Expressway going inbound at uh, four o'clock in the afternoon and to just do everything from my home has been a real thrill and a real treat and a real uh, betterment for my well-being as well as uh, my family's. Um, so I began at the Sun Times working uh, on the desk, which I still do, but my first job was copy editing. And then I was moved into the slot. And what the slot position is, it's the last line of defense for copy and for pages. It's on the last set of eyes who look at the, who looks at the headlines, the decks, the captions, um, the copy itself, as much as you can see in the time that you have before deadline, and then send it off to the presses. Over time, I've worked my way up to now deputy sports editor. My sports editor, the, my boss is Chris DeLuca, who if you're familiar with California media was a big shot out into the LA Times, um, Southern California media operations. He's been the sports editor now for at least 10 years and I've been his deputy for say about five of them. Uh, it's been a real thrill and a real treat and a tremendous access. And in 2018, I began writing a sports media column because the market here hadn't had one for years. Um, our paper had several over the years. The Trib, if you remember from, if you were a Tribune reader, like I was growing up, there was Steve Neiditz. Um, the Sun-Times had Jim O'Donnell, uh, Dale Bowman. Um, but the most famous one was Rudy Martsky out of the USA Today, who was just revered by everybody. And I was a big fan of his. I remember reading him in high school. I'm 49 for anybody who's, who's curious. So we would always um, read what Marksky would write because I would take a, a sports broadcasting class in high school. And every week, whenever there was a Marksky column, our teacher would Xerox it and pass it out to all of us. And so I got really familiar with that line of the business. And I always said, you know, if I, if I really couldn't be a sports beat reporter, like, you know, cover the Cubs or the Hawks or anybody, uh, I really enjoy sports media coverage, I, I, would, I would do that. So in 2018, nobody in the city was covering sports media. You know, the papers were getting slashed um, and, and sports media coverage really had gone down nationally significantly too. But some things that have been happening in that space and in our market where I would say to my, to my boss, you know, um, the Chicago Fire had moved their games to this newfound, this newfangled ESPN Plus putting their games behind the paywall. And I said, you know, if we had a media columnist, I would just tell that guy to rip into that team because how can they put their games, all of their games behind a paywall? And he said, okay, fine, whatever. And then another time I said, and you know, if, if we had a media columnist, I would say those graphics on WGN TV, those sports, they're, they're just hideous. No, they don't make any sense. They have no color. They have no, they're, there's nothing to look at. They're dreary, they're drab. And finally he said to me, well, listen, if you're going to do it, will you do it already? And so it was after pushing him enough for <laughs> a beat that we didn't have to give to somebody else to do that he finally said, if you're going to do it, let's do it and let's do it right. And so ever since March of 2018, every week since, um, aside from a handful of I took a vacation, uh, I would, I've been writing sports media columns. And when news would break, I would jump in with a sports story about it. So when Jason Benetti left the Sox for the Tigers, I jumped in on that. Or when I was able to break a story, and I've, I've broken my share on this beat now, when the Cubs were going to sign up with Marquee before 2020, I had that story. So it's been a lot of fun to get back into the teeth of journalism and reporting on my own, in addition to working on the copy desk, which I also still do. I'm the night editor, you could call it. Uh, still the last line of defense, but now just... Now, five nights a week instead of a couple, as I would have done when I was just starting. Uh, five nights a week, weekends, whenever, on the last eyeballs on the pa each page of the sports section, which um, can be intense and can be pressure-filled. We have deadlines to meet, um, 10.30 and 11.30 Central Time. And whether the game ends or not, you've got to have a story in that paper. So I'm a newspaper guy to the core. I did it in junior high. I did it in high school. I did it in college at Illinois for the Daily Illini. And I just love the business. It's a different business now. It's very much web-based. It's very much handheld. Uh, but it's still the biggest moneymaker at the Sun-Times is still the newspaper, if you can believe that. Despite all the ad advances we've made on the website, uh, for desktop, for mobile, for iPad, uh, the newspaper is still what pays the bills. And until that changes, 
I think we're going to be here. We have new ownership from Chicago Public Media. So we're partners with WBEZ, which is the NPR affiliate in the city. And it's always been a very well-respected and well-listened to radio station. So we have print, we have audio. We think we have the best of both mediums to be a real strong media source in the city. Because what the Tribune has had happen to them has just been awful. They're now run by Alden Capital, which is just a, a hedge fund that leeches money and turns their product into mostly <clears throat> unreadable and irrelevant stories, which is very frustrating as a consumer of media to see how far they've fallen and to see um, friends of mine who work there and have to tolerate that is is very disappointing. As a competitor, though, uh, I what I'll call hate read <laughs> the Tribune just to see what they don't have that we do or how they treated something that we treated differently just out of the pure competitive juices that I still have from those that heyday of the competition in the you know 70s 80s 90s when the papers are really at each other's throats for scoops and stories so along those lines of media um, I'm sure all of you were affected by the recent NFL playoff game that was moved. Well, I shouldn't say it was moved because it was never actually on NBC. And that's what the NFL will tell you is that, well, this game was never really scheduled for over the air television. It was an extra game that we just happened to put on Peacock. BS. Every NFL playoff game in the history of NFL playoff games that has aired on television has aired over public television over-the-air television that you don't even need internet connection for. You need a television set in rabbit ears, if that. So this game has moved to Peacock, which NBC reportedly paid $110 million, hoping to get big bang for their buck. And they seem to have done well. They got 23 million viewers, according to Nielsen, for this game on Peacock. Now, I wasn't really hurt by it. I paid the $2.99 a month for a year. Uh, I have Comcast, so I have Xfinity, and I just said, if they're going to put all these games on Peacock, Big Ten football, Big Ten basketball, I need to watch my Illini. For the first year, let's give it a try for $2.99 a month. It's not an exorbitant cost. But that's not the point. The point that really angers me, and truly angers me, is that they are making you pay twice. They are double dipping you. They are double dipping you. They're picking you up and dipping you into the dip twice because not only are you paying for the cable already, which includes the regional sports fee you have to pay for, the broadcast fee that's for the retransmission of, of, of over the air television stations. Now they're making you pay for a streaming service to watch the games on it you had already paid for before. And that frustrates me, but this is the direction we're going. Streaming is not the future, it is the present. And if you follow the news in the media today, in the medium today, you may have seen that Amazon has now taken up an investment in Diamond Sports Group. Now, this doesn't affect my world because we don't have any Bally Sports Network affiliates. But in other markets of the country, most markets, most, most of the smaller major sports markets in the country are affected by this. You have just last year in, in Phoenix and San Diego, markets that lost their regional sports network that were Bally sports networks because they weren't making money. They weren't getting the ratings. They weren't being viewed and they didn't have the financial backing. So they disappeared essentially. And Major League Baseball picked up those networks to air Padres and Diamondbacks games. And now as we moved into hockey and basketball season in Phoenix, the network has gone for good. And now they have the Suns and the Coyotes over, over the air television. If you're familiar with what WGN TV was back in the day, a super station where you could watch locally. We'll talk from a local perspective there, but since it was available nationwide at the time, you could watch the Cubs. You could watch the White Sox. Uh, when the Bulls were available, they were on there. Uh, eventually the Blackhawks returned to WG and they were all over the air and it was all available to anybody who had an antenna. Those days are coming back because of these regional sports networks folding. And it's funny to see that in, in, in Oklahoma City, in Utah, in San Diego, in Phoenix, 
these major pro teams returning to over the air television because the RSN model is dying and there is distribution, there is exposure. Imagine that over the air, free television has a wide reach of people and, and easy access for those people. So it's funny how things are coming full circle to where we went from cable, which had everything you wanted, but people didn't like that they were having to subsidize channels that they weren't watching. Totally understand if your grand, if, if my grandmother was watching, um, you know, her channels, but she was paying for my sports channels, that was a raw deal for her. So people wanted a la carte. And then streaming came along where it allowed you a la carte. Okay, now you can watch all your sports channels over here. And the people who don't want them don't have to pay for them. But now what's happened? The streamers are being bundled. They are forming a cable bundle. Uh, Amazon has all these channels you could get like you would cable and bundle them under Amazon. You can go to your Max app and watch CNN. ESPN Plus eventually will be a direct-to-consumer service and have ABC probably games on there and other Disney-affiliated games. So what's, what goes around comes around. What's new? What, what's old is new again. And it's a really crazy time in sports media. It's a fascinating time. I love talking about the technology behind it and the reasons that we're here. But for the consumer, it's brutal because they have to follow where all their games are. They have to follow what team belongs to which service. And they have to follow, you know, when the Cubs started Marquee Sports Network, the whole point of it was, aside from making money, was to get them off the four or five channels that they were on. They were on WGN Channel 9. They were on NBC Sports Chicago. They'd have games on, used to have them on CLTV, uh, uh, WPWR Channel 50. They were all over the dot. They wanted them all in one place on Marquee. Well, they had that for like a year because then MLB went and sold, sold their games to Apple. They sold them to NBC Peacock. They're on Apple. Uh, they're on um, uh, Fox. So they're still all over the place, just not as much as they used to be because of streaming. So as advantageous as a uh, of a technology as it can be, it's also very difficult um, to follow because there's so much of it. There's so much content out there that everybody just doesn't know where it all is. So I have a note, I have some notes here. I just wanna take a quick peek to see what we have going on here. Uh, I live in market of the Trib sister, the Hartford Current. Uh, it is a shell of what it used to be, yes, very similar. So all those Tribune newspapers um, uh, in Florida, uh, the Baltimore Sun, I believe is another one, the New York Daily News. The New York Daily News is a travesty as to what it used to be. You compare that with the New York Post, which outside of our sports section is my favorite sports section in the country because I love the tabloid look and the tabloid feel and what you can do with a back cover of a tabloid like they do. And I often model our back pages off of theirs just because it's so tabloidy, sensationalism. It's sports. You know, you can have fun with that kind of presentation of a back page um, and really uh, make something sparkle, make something stand out that people visually can can you know remember so i really enjoy uh and the, and the daily news still does that with their back page but it's if you go inside and look it's so much wire copy they'll have a rangers game at the garden and they won't even have somebody there to cover it and again i, I don't blame the people putting the paper out people in charge are in a rough spot given that their ownership is just ripping them apart and we have bally's here in cleveland right and so things are up in the air with who will broadcast their game. I saw that it was the Rangers and the Guardians who of the networks that Diamond Sports Group, which owns all of these belly networks, uh, those were two that were still outstanding as to where those teams might end up because the Rangers want to take their games back. And the, uh, I almost called them the Indians. I just did. The Guardians don't know what they're going to do. So those are still two teams up in the air. But now that Amazon has invested in Diamond Sports Group, those games should appear on Amazon as an in-market streamer. Again, that won't be an over-the-air component. That won't be the over-the-air component. We'll see where those end up. But as far as in-market streaming for those nine other MLB teams and a dozen of NBA and NHL teams, 
Um, those will end up on Amazon Prime, which is really diving into sports. Ever since they got the NFL, they've gone for more and more, not just documentaries, but teams and games. I feel bad for Yankees fans, if there's any in the audience here, who have to have not only the Yes Network on cable, they have to have Prime to watch the games on Wednesdays. Um, they would have games on Apple. They would have games on Peacock. They would have the games on Fox. There were like five or six different services they would have to have to watch those games, which is just, it's overextending themselves. Um, I thought Diamond Sports went bankrupt. Yes, they are in bankruptcy court. They are in a chapter 11 proceeding. Now I'm not savvy enough or smart enough to figure out all that stuff, but I can tell you the basis, the, the basics of it are that it's a restructuring in that they can't afford what they don't have to pay for it. So Amazon is coming in and dishing and investing billions of dollars to help keep them afloat to pay for the rights for those teams' games. It's very complicated. It's a restructuring. I don't know if Diamond Force Group will survive this. Those games might end up going back to the leagues and appearing over the air in local markets. But as far as streaming goes, and MLB was not happy about this because they wanted all those games over their service. Amazon has jumped in and complicated this, excuse me, even more. So those Bally Sports Networks, definitely a headache for fans and a headache for themselves too, because no one quite knows how this is really gonna, gonna end up. Another big topic that's being talked about in my city is the NFL draft. In fact, it's all that will be talked about for the next three months because the Blackhawks are irrelevant without Connor Bedard. And even when he comes back, they'll just be in second to last place in the league. The Bulls are going the wrong way again. Uh, and the Cubs and Sox will be starting spring training in February. So not a whole lot to get excited about there just yet. So, and this was the case today on sports radio, since I listened to it way too much for my own good, but both sports stations in town, it was like an, hour two hours straight of bears talk and the draft what will the bears do because they hold all the cards they have a quarterback and this isn't really just a local story now because this like i said they hold all the cards for the whole draft for the whole league they are in control they don't just have the number one pick in the draft they have potentially the number one available quarterback uh who has a contract on the market in justin fields you know, I saw Mel Kuyper saying this week where he, he could he could see he could see them getting a first round pick from somebody for Justin Fields, which would then give them the first pick, another pick, depending on the team, if it were the Falcons, which people are talking about a lot, that'd be the eighth pick, and they'd have their own ninth pick. So they'd have three first round picks, three top ten picks which I can't remember the last time that's happened. There have been plenty of times where they've had, where teams have had two first round picks or even two top 10 picks. Um, I remember the Browns had that recently. I think the Jets may have two. But to have three in the top 10 would be unheard of. And that is a possibility. Um, one of the stations in town actually today was playing Bill Belichick talking, heaping praise on Justin Fields. It was from last season before they, before those two teams met in that game on Monday night. It was the last time the Bears won until until this year, until this until this October, uh, before they went on their 16 game losing streak. I think it was um, the longest in, in franchise history. And he was effusive in praise of Fields for his dynamism, his ability to move. Uh, but he still has, and everybody who's watched him knows there's still issues there. I have a I have a 16 year old here who will go on NFL Plus, another streaming service, and uh, go to the All 22 video and and break it down and he'll analyze he'll take a screenshot of it and see look justin had this guy open here or this guy open here how did he not see him or why isn't this receiver open film breakdown is quite the industry in uh, among the youth and among nfl fans really um so there are still a lot of issues with justin but there's untapped potential there i think and i think a lot of people still do think that that the bears can parlay him into if not a first round pick, multiple picks and set themselves up. Now, so let's say they take Caleb Williams with first the first overall pick. You have to think that the other quarterback uh, from North Carolina, 
his name right here. I'm so many names in my head. Drake May on North Carolina would go second, and then the Patriots come up at third, and now they've got a decision to make because Marvin Harrison is sitting right there. People would love it if the Bears took him first because they need a receiver so badly, and they really do already have a quarterback. Or maybe they could take Marvin Harrison first and trade up with another pick to get a quarterback. But, uh, you know, there's so many ways this can go. And this is going to be really even more interesting than last year when the Bears got DJ Moore and traded their first, their number one pick then, which was their own. That was fascinating. But this is going to be even more fascinating because it's going to involve so many more teams and layers because of the Justin Fields aspect to it. So I haven't seen a GM in such in, in the catbird seat, like as, as Ken Hall Carlson used to say, uh, in, in a better position than Ryan Poles is. And I think people here have a sense that he does know what he's doing. He seems very shrewd. And the deal he made with the Panthers was such a franchise turning trade to get not only the number one pick from Carolina, but uh, the, uh, the turn to turn that into so many assets, including DJ Moore, one of the best receivers in the NFL. People are giving Ryan Poles um, a lot of leeway, a lot of margin for error, it seems. A lot of trust would be the better word to pull off something like that again. Although it could just be as simple as taking Caleb Williams and then trading Justin Fields and, and seeing what uh, what comes up. There, two years ago, right, the Jets had picks. I can get rid of these little buttons here. Go away. They got Sauce Gardner, right, and Garrett Wilson. Two pretty good picks. Too bad, uh, wait, right, they had the number five for, yeah, those are all good picks. It's just, yeah, you know, that's one thing that really bothered me. Um, I was really excited for Aaron Rodgers this year, this season. I was genuinely interested to see how that was going to go down because the talent is undeniable. And the buildup was so, was, was through the roof. They had done so much to set that team up for him. And I was, you know, not just, not just the Jets, the whole league set up the season for the Jets. They were on television, on national TV, as much as they could be. They were in exclusive windows. When he went down, that all went to kaput. <laughs> Who wanted to see that team anymore? But that's why it was it was so tough to watch that happen because I wanted to really see how it was going to work out. Would he actually turn the Jets into um, a, a playoff team, a Super Bowl team? I, I think it was possible. But then, then to hear his antics of of last week on that pat mcafee show i don't know if anybody's watched that show it's it's an entertaining show the show that's been in the news lately through all of aaron Rodgers' visits and his anti-covid rants and nonsense of the like that he spews that really i had already been somewhat turned off by aaron given his previous behavior and holding the packers hostage and him being a little off the wall but the stuff he was spewing last week he can go away now because I don't need to deal with him on my television set anymore. If he comes back and is fine and they have another great season, it won't be nearly as joyful or fruitful as it probably would have been uh, this past year. And he stayed healthy because that was just, I turned into a train wreck of a season. Those poor, those poor Jets fans. I felt so bad for them. Fourth snap. And their season was, was over right then. It was done. There was no chance of them of that, uh, of that getting any better. Um, if anybody has any questions, feel free to raise your hand or, or chime in. Uh, I'm just going off my script here. Um, getting back to the NFL draft, I used to cover that for Pro Football Weekly. And what it has become is beyond anything else I could have envisioned. When we used to cover the NFL draft when I was at Pro Football Weekly, and I was there 1996 to 2002, you would have the scouting combine in Indianapolis. And it wasn't, you know, there was no, it was the, it was the RCA dome at the time. It was the Hoosier dome. And you couldn't watch the combine. You, it was all a secret. All the 40 times and, and bench pressing and heights and weights were all a secret. You needed to be a mole to get into that place and find that information out. Uh, we would hang around the lobby of a Marriott uh, Union Station in downtown Indianapolis, try to find coaches and agents. That's where they were all staying for the combine, for their clients and for their their teams. It was, everything was so tight lipped and to the vest and all those cliches. Then years went by and eventually the NFL set it up where you could actually 
interview the players at at, uh, at at podiums, and they would have working rooms where you could uh, write your stories from, and they would make people available to you. And that was all great. And then, and then within the last ten years, the most secret and 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 closely guarded information is available to everyone because you can watch it on the NFL Network. They post all their heights and weights and 40 times and bench presses. There are draft guys that have all the information you could possibly want. We were really the first to do that. If you if you if you recall the name Joel Buxbaum, uh, a New York guy, Brooklyn born, Brooklyn raised, was the first guy to have those draft guides. Draft guides. Even before Mel Kuyper did. He was Kuyper before Kuyper, but he wasn't tell it. He wasn't photogenic. He didn't speak well. He was a frail little man who would not look well on TV, but he had the ears of Bill Belichick, Bill Parcells. These guys listened to him and he gave them information that they formed their opinions around and they built their teams with his guide in their hands. So to have that as our backbone and our draft coverage was a thrill and, and validating every year. But now, the draft Nick craze is such where everybody has a draft guide and you've got to really trust whose information you are trusting. You've got to, you've got to have the knowledge that that person knows what they're talking about. Otherwise it's just some guy in their parents' basement watching NFL network or cutting up tape from pirated film sources online. Um, there is so much, and like I said before, the, the, the amount of content that is available out there is so overwhelming. Not just the content that's accessible to anyone, but the content you want to go find. You know, you do a Google search for draft predictions, and you will find hundreds, maybe thousands of websites and and self-appointed draft gurus who are happy to share with you their opinion, whether they charge for it or not. The draft has become this this monolith of 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 information, and now you see how it's presented on television, where they're going from city to city. They used to all be at, at the gardens, at the Madison Square Garden Theater underneath the basketball floor. We would be in the theater, it'd be um, it'd be a crowd, it'd be a crowd there, but now you're getting thousands of people, tens of thousands of people watching it live on site at, 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 at stadium halls or stadium stadiums themselves, or as they were last year in Vegas of all places where the Super Bowl will be last year, uh, this, this year. And if you would have told me 20 years ago when gambling was so taboo to the NFL that the Super Bowl would ever be in Las Vegas, I would not have believed you because at that time at our place of Pro Football Weekly, we would have gambling advertisers from offshore places that would that would put their ads in our paper. Nothing, nothing from the Continental 48. Um, so to see how far gambling as well has made its way into sports media and the sports universe itself, where now you have score bugs, you know, where you see the score on television and some of the games will have the line or the total within them is is wild. That ESPN has ESPN bet is crazy that it has been this accepted this rapidly by every league, not just the NFL. All of the leagues, golf, auto racing, they've all had partnerships with the DraftKings, with a FanDuel, uh, with ESPN Bet. Um, again, the content is so overwhelming. There's so much of it everywhere that it can be too much to handle. There's just, you need the bundle back. I always say, uh, I will never give up cable because it's all right there. I got my little cable box and it's everything I need right there. We need that. For sports because there's not just one place to go anymore it's omnipresent it is everywhere gambling yes i just saw the note right here um so that happened in 2018 when the supreme court sent sent those laws to the state level and said if you want to have sports gambling that's on you and illinois came in a year or so later um new york now has it where it's it's all mobile too. And I want to say more than half of the country has, you can bet within your state um, on sports. Now in some places like in Illinois, you, you, you can't bet online for colleges, but you can go into a brick and mortar place and do it. 
So I'm not all that privy on up to up to speed on that. But the gambling information within sports media has exploded because you have the fan duels and the DraftKings that have their own media platforms. Uh, Dan Lebitard, you'll see his his um, uh, Meadowlark company has a deal where their content will appear within a gambling service. There was talk that they might even get their own insiders. Uh, Brett McMurphy, if you know if you're familiar with the Action Network, he is their college sports insider, and he gets he breaks stories, but he works for Action Network, which is a gambling outlet. There was thoughts that Adam Schefter. Or or Sham Shamar or, or, or Woj, Adrian Wojnarowski, the NBA guy, might go to a gambling service to be their insider, because that's where the money is, and that's where the money's money's being made. That hasn't happened, but there definitely was discussions about that possibility. But like I said, they are creating their own content because there is a need for it out there. There's the BetQL network out of Chicago, which is uh, a betting network. That's all the programming is, is, is gambling. There's the sports grid on Sirius XM satellite radio. It's gambling all the time. There's vision, B-I-S-N, which you might see on a Bally sports channel. We have it on marquee here in Chicago. It was Brett, it was Brett, uh, Brent Musburger's baby out of Las Vegas. It's gambling all day. Um, I enjoy it to an extent. I don't gamble, but the information and the analysis is a unique spin on a normal analysis for a game to hear their reasoning for their predictions and projections interest me. But as far as, you know, who to place a bet on, I stay away from that. I'm going to keep my money to myself. Uh, but gambling is definitely, I would say the two biggest new realms in sports media today. And, and the two most complicated by far are the streaming element and the gambling element. And in some respects they're coming together because you can have a game where you will have a gambling version of that game. NBC Sports Chicago, um, a regional RSN here that has the Bulls and the Sox and the Hawks, has had bet casts for Bulls games. It was just a straight betting version of the game broadcast. We've done that in other markets too. Um, Marquee Sports Network here had had a Cubs similar bet cast, betting on baseball, opposite it's regular broadcast of the Cubs game. So people are coming up with ways to involve gambling, maybe not in their main broadcast, but in a supplementary broadcast, which which is another real element of, of sports broadcasting that's been new in the last several years, like the Manning cast. These alternate broadcasts are a new wave of broadcasting. And they do, look, they're never going to do as well as the main broadcast, but the Peyton Manning and Eli Manning show does pretty well for what it is. Um, the mega cast for the ESPN when they put one on for the college football title game, those do well. Amazon has alternate broadcasts. I personally love watching the um, next gen stats broadcast. It's it's the same audio and video, but it has extra bells and whistles that make it really tech savvy and, and really cool. So that'd be a third realm, but not really as close as streaming and, and gambling. But the alternate telecast to games um, really has has evolved. Um, another big story in where I live, and then I'll throw it open for questions. It's been talked about over the country is the Bulls and their fans' response to Jerry Krause being named to the Ring of Honor um, last week, which was a horrible scene that could have been prevented in in in, in different ways. Um, and and a, a a viewer here said, "What were your impressions of the Last Dance series?" Big fan of that series. I've watched it twice, maybe even three times. Uh, it was a huge Bulls fan of the 90s, of course. Who wasn't? I mean, where I live, at least. But that relates to what happened last Friday because people who watched The Last Dance saw how the Bulls players treated Jerry Krause, and it was not well. They called him crumbs. They made fun of his appearance, his weight. They didn't like him. They didn't like him for the moves he was making. They didn't like him for what they considered to be backroom antics and to this day clearly as last friday showed where he was booed posthumously at an event that was supposed to celebrate and honor him uh, the booing was enough to make his wife who was in attendance to represent him uh, get emotional and cry on, on television 
And that's has struck a nerve with almost everyone in sports media. And locally, the blame has shifted from the Bulls, who probably should have seen that coming, given that they were there when Krauss was there, and they saw when he would be in public or when he would be in an event that the reaction was not always favorable. But now to why that has happened, that's on Jordan and Pippen and those players who belittled Kraus and belittled his role in making those teams. He didn't draft Michael Jordan, but he drafted everybody around Michael Jordan. And to say that he had a limited role in those teams is asinine. You can make fun of him for, if you want to be petty, if you want to make fun of him for his, uh, his mannerisms for his organizations win championships for some of the things he would say that's all that's fine but no one can minimize his role in putting those teams together it's it doesn't happen without him they don't get pippen they don't get grant they don't put those they don't get coo coach they don't get put those those teams aren't what they are without him putting them together and for all the heck that he takes um, he should be getting just as much praise for those accomplishments and for the fans to boo him as vociferously as they did in a setting that was supposed to be a celebration was awful. And no, not everybody booed, but people on radio here are saying if you were one of the one, if you were one of the ones who booed, you should be ashamed of yourself. And it's not because he's dead, nothing to do with that. It has to do with the respect for the work and the effort and the results that he he received, that he achieved. Um, so that's been a really big point of discussion in this city um, this week. And it's just a shame because it's, it's a bad look for, for the Bulls and for Bulls fans and for this city. No one wants to be compared to Philadelphia, but that's what people here were being compared to were, you know, booing and throwing snowballs at Santa Claus and, um, you know, yelling and cheering when Michael Irvin was thought to have, been concussed and, and broken his spine on the field at the old vet, which the, the Eagles fans at the time were very much in favor of. No one wants to be compared to that, but that was a lot of the talk um, here today. I've spoken for a long time. Is there? I, I'll look here to see more questions, but if anybody would like to uh, ask something specific. There's another question about the NCAA. Okay. What is your opinion of NCAA Division One football players going into the portal? It's a, a nuanced answer. I think it's about, I hate the portal. I don't like, I don't, I hate the portal, but how can, but I'm not, I don't, uh, I'm in favor of the portal. Can you be on both sides? I hate that college sports has become free agency, yet I'm all in favor of a player who does not get paid to be able to go out and sell themselves now for NIL money on an open market. So I guess there's part of me that still would like to see the Rose Bowl be the champion of the Big Ten and the Pac-10, because that was all we were rooting for growing up was get to the Rose Bowl. We didn't care about national championships. I wanted Illinois to play somebody in the Rose Bowl, uh, you know, in January. But now it's a different era where not only do the bulls mean nothing but allegiance means nothing uh it seems rare that a player stays at a college for four years and if he does stay in college for four years he may have gone through four colleges to get to the fourth year it's not what i like it's not what i was accustomed to but i cannot begrudge an athlete from doing that from bettering themselves. Um, it's just not, they were sold to Billy Goods for so long, you know, be loyal to your, be loyal to your school, be loyal to your coach and your teammates. Well, they've kind of figured it out where the coaches aren't always loyal to them or their schools. They jump from job to job to job. So why should the player be hamstrung or curtailed by those same rules? If the coach can go away, and leave for a school and coach the next year, why can't a player go change schools and play the next year? Used to be he had to sit out the next year and lose a year of eligibility. 
Well, that was absurd because his coach left him and is free to go off and make all the money he wants somewhere else. So they were sending the wrong message to the players, but they have figured this out. And with the NIL support, uh, you have players making millions of dollars before they even go pro. They may not even need to go pro if they if they choose not to and have an extra year of college, whether it be from the COVID year, although those are running out. Um, so it, it's, it's difficult still for me to accept that this is the new realm. This is the new reality of college sports. But I don't begrudge the players for doing it. It's just harder to follow. It's harder to follow. You know, Illinois basketball has had three different teams in the last three years. You know, since I had to sumu left, they've had three different lineups almost in full because of the transfer portal. Somebody leaves, they go get somebody in. Um, that Dr. Pepper commercial cracks me up where you have the football players being sucked into the black hole portal because, you know, they're all leaving their school. That's that's what it is when you're getting now hundreds of players in the transfer portal. It's essentially free agency. I don't like the way it looks. I don't, you know, this was supposed to be amateur sports. It's not. That facade is over. And I think we all, myself included, just have to accept that. Harbaugh staying at Michigan and dealing with NCAA going to the NFL. Oh, I think he's gone. I think he's gone. He's already interviewed with um, Atlanta, uh, San Diego. Uh, Bill Belichick has also interviewed with Atlanta. Uh, that's interesting to watch, too. Um, I think Harbaugh is, has done his job at Michigan. He's He brought up the national title. What more can he do there? He's done it. If he wants, if his next unfulfilled dream is to win the Super Bowl, which he almost did, but couldn't against his brother, then this mm -hmm. is the time to go. Um, this is, which as an Illinois fan and a, a non-Michigan fan, great, go, goodbye. Uh, let them uh, suffer a little bit now. So, yeah, I think he's going to question is where, where will he land? And here you have Bears fans who are a little unhappy that they stuck with Matt Eberflus because all of a sudden, all of a sudden, and in the days after they said they're going to keep Eberflus, Pete Carroll became available. Bill Belichick became available. Jim Harbaugh is available. Um, all these big name coaches became available. But in, in the end, there was never a chance that the McCaskies were going to go get any of those people because they were never going to have someone that influential, that powerful, be their head coach. They went through that with Mike Ditka and they will never ever do that again because they saw how that went down. Um, so they're going to have somebody who's much more mild mannered, which, which Matt Iberflus is much more in line with their lane, which Matt Iberflus is. So it'll be fun to see where all these coaches land. But uh, what's interesting about it is that, there was no Black Monday. It got it became a Black Week because you had Arthur Smith, the Falcons coach, fired Sunday night. Monday was just one coach fired. And I'm blanking on which team that was. But then as the week went on, Mike Vrabel was fired. Pete Carroll left. Bill Belichick left. Um, it was amusing in that it wasn't all just in one day, but you're ending up with like eight coaching vacancies in the NFL. And we're going to have to wait some time to see how this all gets filled because that's not just eight coaches. That's eight coaching staffs and teams with coaches like the Bears need to fill their own staff. You know, when's the last time you saw a head coach? I'm sure it's happened, but the Bears head coach needs to coordinate. Uh, that's rare for the head coach to have to replace the D coordinator and the O coordinator, but still have his job. That's um, and, and, and again, the D coordinator was let go for not football reasons. Nevertheless, it's it's black and white that he needs two new coordinators. The Browns first, they uh, offensive coordinator, running backs, tight coach today. Okay, so there, another staff in need of uh, plugging holes that will have to compete with the coaches who are going to put together entire staffs. Um, at least, at least this weekend we have four games on over the air television. That's uh, yeah. that's the big takeaway. No, uh, so, no peacock. So, Jeff, um, while we do have one more question, you can ask who will pick the coordinators for the Bears: Pace, Warren, or Everfloss? Oh, oh. Well, the word is that um, Eberflus will, but Pace will have a very large say because Eberflus picked his last staff, and that turned into two coaches leaving 
uh, or being fired essentially for misconduct in the office and firing of Lou Getze just for incompetence. So Ryan Pace will have a greater say, if not the final say, in Iberflus's replacements for offense and defensive coordinator. I don't think Kevin Warren will undermine Ryan Poles. I think even though Ryan, Kevin Warren did not hire Ryan Poles, I think they're in lockstep. I think Kevin Warren respects and appreciates what Ryan Poles has done, and he has earned that. That trade really gave him the right to see this rebuild out. And now what he does this offseason will probably give him even more time to see that through because I'll have a rookie quarterback on a rookie contract for four years playing that through. So he'll be here a while. Iberflus will see if he's here through the time that Ryan Poles is. Next year will be a big year for him. Um, but definitely Ryan Poles will have, I think, more influence on his staff this coming season. So we, this will be our last question, and then we'll do a wrap-up. So about Major League Baseball and salaries. Our owners are general managers of Chicago teams. No, I'm yes. sorry, you, sal salaries? Am I missing there's one? one? There's a, yeah. I just saw one pop up. Hold on. Let's see we could. Oh, Major League Baseball payroll inflation? Your views on Major League Baseball payroll inflation and inequity of teams. Oh, man. What <laughs> sport? What sport needs a salary cap more than baseball, but never will? Because Marvin Miller, may he rest in peace, made that union the strongest union in the history of sports unions. Um, it is so, in what other sport does your market determine, I shouldn't be so definitive. What other sport can your market determine how successful financially you are. Because look at the Tampa Bay Rays. They're a juggernaut, but they don't draw. Their stadium, you've probably seen. I've been to. I don't think it's as bad <laughs> as people say it is. I've been to it. it I, I, I liked it there. But it's, it's, okay. not, it's not anything to write home about. They do it. They pull it off. The Royals did in 2015. It, it can be done, but it takes a lot more work. But to see what the Dodgers are doing, that's ridiculous but they do it because they can uh that's what the yankees do because they can the mets the red sox you know the cubs we thought they were going to when they bought craig council um hopefully they'll get cody bellinger here and show that they are a big market team but they don't seem to operate like one all the time even though they are and they have money coming out of their ears um it's it's preposterous what the dodgers have done and in baseball, the beauty is, and I'm hoping it might not work. It did happen to work for the Marlins. I think it was 93 when they bought Gary Sheffield, Moises Salou, all those guys, and um, they bought themselves a World Series and, and they eventually won. It wasn't easy, but they won. But with baseball, as the Dodgers themselves have shown, Baseball is a different breed. And now that it's harder than the baseball playoffs to even win, you know, one series since, since there's four now, um, it's going to be harder for them to do. But, man, are they equipped to do it. It's, it is ridiculous, though. So uh, we have a uh, running really out of time. Um, you just mentioned the Red Sox. I, that, that was in the past. We're not spending money anymore here. Yeah, that was in the past. True. <laughs> that was in the True. past. But the uh, – uh, you have a really, really great perspective. Uh, it was uh, really edifying. I, th I think the conclusion of what you're telling us between Peacock Network, because it's not going to get, it's going to get, they made money. It's all about yeah. making money. It's it's not going to get better. People are cutting their cable cords, and they're, this is just the way of the world. And you, yeah. you really hit on a lot of key points, and I think your comment about the Dodgers, I think that just sums it all. It's really serious. Sports is a great diversion. There's a lot of crap going on in the world, and people really spend, the, you know, when I, I, I'll just relate to you, uh, we're here in, in Boston, and they actually interrupted the morning news programs to say that Bill Belichick has retired, has left the Patriots. Yeah. Now, I can, I don't doubt it. There's, that was 24 years. So I would and, actually and, and, and expect so them to. The gambling and the, yeah. 
everything you're talking about, it, it's just true. So I guess it's good to be in your business because people really uh, are filing sports and taking it very seriously. And I think you just gave us a really good um, a viewpoint of what it's like to work in sports. We really, really appreciate it. We love Thank your you. uncle. We love your uncle. <laughs> I Very hope kind of you. He's the best. We all do. He's. I can't tell you how many places anyone in my family goes with my last name who asks, are you related to Jerry? Um, my wife was just saying at dinner how she gets it just because of the last name. It's uh, his, I have a cousin who's put to his... Uh, who puts his last name on his license plate just to make it more apparent of, of who he's related to. So yeah, it's, it's out there. So thank you very, very, very much. David, you want to wrap up? And Norman? Yes, I do. So I have some thank yous. First, I want to thank uh, Danny Mando, my co-chairman, Creighton Cohn, our computer maven. I want to thank everybody for joining this evening. I would also like to thank Nolan Murrins for getting our speaker because I really appreciate that. And I want to thank Jeff Agris because you were absolutely phenomenal. I really, really well, enjoyed it. I'm a big sports guy. I love it. I love sports. You're very kind and, of you. And you, thank you. And your your perspective was incredible. I just was fascinated by what you had to say. And your enthusiasm for sports is is I think is if something be matched by me because I'm a sports nut. I think <laughs> yours is probably even more than I am. And, I don't, and that's saying a lot. So I just want to thank you again for doing that. Um, thank you. You're welcome. I want to thank everybody for being on the program and uh, try to stay warm, everybody, wherever you are. Well, that's so thank you peace. all so much. Be thank you very much. Again. Take care. Thank you. Thank, thank you. you. Good night, everyone.